Hello, my name's Roisin and welcome or welcome back to my channel. In the last video I promised you that there was going to be another video of anticipated releases and that is this video. This video is all about the historical fiction that is coming out at the end of June, in July, August and at the beginning of September. The summer historical fiction releases. I talk a lot about historical fiction on this channel. I will leave a playlist in the cards above if you are interested in hearing more about my favourite historical fiction or seeing me try it out reading different types of historical fiction. But I have 25 books for you that are coming out over the course of the summer and so I'm going to jump straight in. The first book is coming out on the 24th of June and that is Moth by Melody Rizak. This has been praised by Claire Chambers, Sally Magnuson, Sarah Winman, so it's had a lot of hype and was one of the Observer's top 10 debut novels of 2021. So it's one that a lot of people have been excited to read. Delhi, 1946. Ma and Bapu are liberal intellectuals teaching at the local university. Their 14-year-old daughter, precocious headstrong Alma, is soon to be married. Alma is mostly interested in the wedding shoes and in spinning wild stories for her beloved younger sister. Times are bad for girls in India. The long-awaited independence from British rule is heralding a new era of hope. When partition happens and the British Raj is fractured overnight, this wonderful family is violently torn apart and its members are forced to find increasingly desperate ways to survive. As you may know if you've watched my videos in the past, the um, British Empire and the deterioration of the British Empire is a subject in which I'm interested. I love reading historical fiction set all around the world, so this book set in India sounds like it's going to be fantastic. The next one sounds like it's going to be a little strange and that is Elephant by Paul Pickering who has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize in the past. In a country house in England, a precocious teenage exile from revolutionary Russia sets down his adventures on paper, beginning with his first ball in St Petersburg and how he frees a huge African elephant from a cruel circus. But a hundred years later, an American academic feels the boy may have invented the elephant as the only kind and uplifting being in dark times. As I mentioned in my last video, I'm really interested in Russian history and I also love a book with an unreliable narrator and when we're not sure what quite we can possibly believe. Um, so this one sounds exciting for those reasons. Next out on the 8th of July is Sea Change by Alex Nathan and this is one that I know that Simon from Savage Reads has read on his channel. Um, I also really like the cover. The last Eve saw of her mother was a wave from a basket of a rising balloon. A willful lonely orphan in the house of her erratic artist guardian, Eve struggles to retain the image of her missing mother and the father she never knew. In a London beset by pageantry, incipient riot and the fear of Napoleonic invasion, Eve must grow into a young woman with no one to guide her through its perils. Far away in a Norfolk fishing village, the Reverend Sneed preaches hellfire and damnation to his impoverished parishioners and oppressed wife. Sneed illustrates his sermons with the example of a mute woman pulled from the sea, over whom he keeps a very close watch indeed. I really love books that talk about religion, um, particularly religion in small communities, religion meeting science, religion meeting folklore and superstition, um, which it sounds like might be part of this book. And it has also been praised by Hilary Mantel, who said she is an original with a virtuoso touch. Um, the Thomas Cromwell trilogy by Hilary Mantel are my favourite books, so anything that Hilary Mantel blurbs or talks about, I am probably likely to read. In fact, maybe I should make a vlog of reading books that Hilary Mantel has recommended. Let me know in the comments if you would be interested in that. Next coming out on the 6th of July is Alec by William DeCanzo, which is inspired by E.M. Forster's novel of gay love, which was published posthumously, posthumously called Maurice. I haven't read Maurice, but I have read A Room With a View and Passage to India, and I do enjoy E.M. Forster's writing, um, which is one of the things that made me interested in reading this. E.M. Forster's novel of a happy same-sex love affair tells the story of Alex Scudder, the gamekeeper Maurice Hall falls in love with. Dicanzo follows their story past the end of Maurice to the front lines of the battle in World War I and beyond. Foster tried to write an epilogue about the future of his characters but was stymied by the radical change that the Great War brought to their world. With the hindsight of a century, De Canzio imagines a future for them and a past for Alec, a young villager possessed of a remarkable passion and self-knowledge. 
I enjoy reading books about queer history, queer stories set in not a modern time period, I think make for an interesting look at a historical period. And I'm not usually one who really goes for books that are retellings or reworkings of traditional of like classics, but this one sounded really intriguing. Also out on the 8th of July, Dolly Considine's Hotel by Eamon Summers. Dolly Considine runs a late night drinking establishment catering to the needs of thirsty politicians and theatricals in Dublin's legendary drinking area, the Catacombs. Julian Ryder is an 18 year old aspiring writer in need of shelter from his bullying older brother. Julian soon embroils himself in the Shabine's gossip and get the guests bedsheets and turns Dolly's entourage into fodder for his literary ambition. Set against the run up to the pro-life constitutional amendment of September 1983 and moving fluidly between the 1950s of Dolly, Dolly's youth and Julian's summer of unrequited love. My parents are both Irish so I do want to read more Irish literature and I feel particularly this period of Irish history is not something I know a lot about which is something which I always like to explore periods I don't know very well through literature as a way in. Out on the 15th of July is The Hungry and the Lost by Bethany Pope. And Bethany Pope is a poet. I always like to read novels by poets because I love beautiful writing and poets obviously are very conscious of individual word choice. Edwardian Florida. The swamplands of Tampa provide a tough but good living for these men hardy enough to brave the weather and the wildness. Wives for these rough hunters are ordered from catalogues. Attractiveness graded by cooking skills and hip wit. When Ill illness sweeps the area and the local minister dies, his widow, his beloved Rose, succumbs to madness. His daughter Joy must struggle to keep them both alive in what has become a skeleton town, rotting into the swamp and abandoned by all the most, but the most ruthless. The Hungry and the Lost is a novel in the true Southern Gothic style, pitting the world of myth and innocence against the rational grip of progress and modernity. As I mentioned earlier, I love books that do that butting up of modern modernity and science with myth. Um, I also like books that explore women's health and women's mental health in, in history and books set in isolated communities and Southern Gothic. So I feel like all of those things mean that I'm really going to enjoy this book. Out on the 15th of July is A Dangerous Kingdom of Love by Neil Blackmore who wrote Intoxicating Mr Lavelle which is a book that I currently have out from the library but I haven't read yet but I'm looking forward to it. This one is set in the court of King James I and I recently read um, A Net for Small Fishes which was also set in the court of James I and also Till which is about the daughter of King James I although set in Germany because she marries a Prussian prince. Um, so I'm kind of intrigued by this time period at the moment. This is told from the perspective of Francis Bacon, well known as the cleverest man in England who has been caught in a trap. For years he survived the brutal games of the English court, driven by the whims of the idiot King James I. But now, at the moment of his greatest success, a deadly alliance of his enemies has begun closing in on him, led by the king's beautiful and poisonous lover Carr. This new alliance threatened to turn the king against him, so that he may rot in the tower. But he refused to go down without a fight and concocted a new plan to find himself a, be a beguiling young man, supplant Carr in the king's bed and take power for himself. All he needs to do is to find this mysterious and beautiful creature. A Net for Small Fishes was kind of about the same scandal but from the perspective of two women who had been involved being from the perspective of Francis Bacon has really drawn me in. Next one that I also think that Simon Savage has talked about um, and that is The Ophelia Girls by Jane Healy, which comes out on the 22nd of July. I'm a little tentative about this because it sounds really interesting, but it's not super historical, like it's not super far in the past. Also, it has one of those covers that I have previously found intriguing, but have been burnt by in the past. Um, and so I no longer know if I like this really like, I guess, maximalist Victorian folklore kind of cover, because I feel like Sometimes it is kind of the women's fiction of historical fiction, which isn't my preference in terms of this genre. So hopefully this one will be more among my style. In the summer of 1973, Ruth and her four friends are obsessed with pre-Raphaelite paintings and a little bit obsessed with each other. Drawn to the cold depths of the river by Ruth's house, the girls pretend to be the drowning Ophelia with increasingly elaborate tableaus. But by the end of that fateful summer, real tragedy finds them among the banks. 24 years later, Ruth returns to the suffocating once grand house she grew up in, the mother of young twins and 17-year-old Maeve. Joining the family in the country is Stuart, Ruth's childhood friend, who is quietly insinuating them himself into their lives and gives Maeve the attention she longs for. She is recently in remission, unsure of her place in the world, now that she is cancer-free, 
Her parents just want her to be an ordinary teenage girl. This has been praised by Molly Aitken and Claire Beams and I read both of their books last year and enjoyed them um, which has made me drawn to this again. So hopefully it'll be really enjoyable. I love books about like obsessive friendship between women. Uh, next a piece of like fantasy historical fiction which is something that I do like. Um, generally speaking as long as the fantasy isn't too high and there's not too much world building um, and it's just kind of a bit of magic thrown into a historical setting then I'm a fan of it. So it can be a bit hit and miss for me this genre but She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chen which comes out on the 22nd of July has definitely caught my eye. I really like this cover as well. In a famine stricken village on a dusty plain a seer shows two children their fates. For a family's eighth born son there's greatness. For a second daughter nothing. In 1345 China lies restless under the harsh Mongol rule and when a bandit raid wipes out their homes the two children must somehow survive. Zhu Chongba despairs and gives up, but the girl resolves to overcome her identity. So she takes her dead brother's identity and begins her journey. Can Zhu escape what's written in the stars as rebellion sweeps the land? Or can she claim her brother's greatness and rise as high as she can dream? And it has also been compared to Circe by Madeleine Miller, which makes me think that it will be the end of historical fiction fantasy that I enjoy. A historical fantasy reimagining of the rise to power of Zhu Yangzhang. Zhu was the peasant rebel who expelled the Mongols, unified China under native rule and became the founding emperor of the Ming dynasty. It sounds like it could be really really good. Out on the 29th of July is The Last and the Flirt First by Nina Berberova. It's not actually a new book but it is the first time this book has been translated into English. On a crisp September morning trouble comes to the Gorbatov's farm. Having fled the ruins of the Russian Revolution, they have endured crushing labour to set up a small farm in Provence. For the young Ilya Stepanovich, this is to be the future of Russian life in France. For some of his Paris-dwelling countrymen, it is a betrayal of roots, culture and the path back to the motherland. Now, with the arrival of a letter from the capital and a figure from the family's past, their fragile stability is threatened by a plot to lure Ilya's brother, Vasya, back to Russia. And this was translated into English by Marion Schwartz. Uh, I have an interest in Russian history which I think I might have already mentioned in this video and so that has intrigued me about this book. Next another one that I'm a bit unsure of, it could be brilliant or it could be not my style but it has a quote from Sarah Moss on the cover which says a startling heroine um, and I also quite like this cover, I quite like the like stylized stained glass window in these neon colours, very like medieval art but modernised which I think is quite an interesting way to go. I'm hoping that it will be done well. This is called Cecily by Anne Garthwaite and it comes out on the 29th of July as well. You are born high but marry a traitor son. You bear him 12 children, carry his cause and bury his past. You play the game against enemies who wish you ashes. Slowly you rise. You are Cecily. But when the king who governs you proves unfit, what then? Loyalty or treason, death may follow both. The board is set. Time to make your first move. Women in war is something that I am very drawn to whether that is like in the shadow king in the second world war or women in the trojan war those these sort of things do always interest me um the war of the roses is a period of history i feel like i know very very little about um despite being from the uk so um yeah definitely drawn to that one next out on the 3rd of august is the perfume thief timothy shaffer this one is has been described as a gentleman in moscow meets moulin rouge and i am not normally a second world war person prefer my war fiction to be from a different perspective second world war fiction set in the uk france or germany doesn't normally do it for me um but this has been described as a stylish sexy page turner set in Paris on the eve of World War II and it's about a queer American expat a notorious thief. So this sounds like it's going to be a really fun romp rather than your usual like World War II novel and that's what's made me think this might be an exception to my no World War II rule. Clementin is a 72 year old reformed con artist with a penchant for impeccably tailored suits. Her life of crime has led her from the over-wealthy perfume junkies of the Belle Epoque Manhattan to the scented butterflies of Costa Rica, to the spice markets of Marrakesh, and finally the bordellos of Paris, where she settles down in 1930 and opens a shop bottling her favourite extracts for the ladies of the cabaret. Now it's 1941 and Clem's favourite haunt, Madame Boulette, is crawling with Nazis, while Clem's people, the outsiders, the artists and the hustlers, who used to call it home, are disappearing. Clem's first instinct is to go to ground. Cabaret's prized songbird recruits Clem to steal the recipe book of a now missing famous Parisian per perfumer. She can't say no. Her mark is Oscar Voss, a francophile Nazi bureaucrat. 
Pratt, who wants the book and Clem's expertise to himself. Hoping to buy the time and trust she needs to pull off her scheme, Clem settles on a novel strat strategy, telling Voss the truth about the life and love she came to Paris to escape. Also out on the 5th of August is The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. I haven't read any of Shafak's books, but I've heard lots of good things about them, and this one did sound intriguing to me. It's 1974 on the island of Cyprus. Two teenagers from opposite sides of a divided land meet at a tavern in the city they both call home. The tavern is the only place that Kostas, who is Greek and Christian, and Daphne, who is Turkish and Muslim, can meet. In secret, hidden beneath the blackened beams which hang from with garlands of garlic, chilli peppers and wild herbs. Decades later in North London, 16-year-old Ada Kazantzakis has never visited the island where her parents were born. Desperate for answers, she seeks to untangle years of secrets, separation and silence. The only connection she has to the land of her ancestors is a ficus carica growing in the back garden of their home. And this has been praised by Robert McFarlane, who writes really beautiful poetic non-fiction, so hopefully this is really beautiful poetic fiction. Next, another piece of World War II fiction. I don't know what's going on with me right now, but this is by Leila Slamani, and I've heard so many people praise Leila Slamani's work, but I've not read any of it myself. And now that she's written a piece of historical fiction, I feel like maybe it's my time to read some Slamani. So this is The Country of Others, which also comes out on the 5th of August, um, and is set in Alsace in 1944. Mathilde finds herself falling deeply in love with Amine Bel Belhage, a Moroccan soldier billeted in her town, fighting for the French. After the liberation, Mathilde leaves France, following Amine to Morocco. But life here is unrecognisable to this brave and passionate young woman. Her life is now that of a farmer's wife, with all the sacrifices and vexations that brings. Suffocated by the heat, by her loneliness on the farm, by the mistrust she inspires as a foreigner, and the lack of money, Matilda grows rest restless. As Morocco's own struggle for independence grows daily, Mathilde and Amin find themselves caught in the crossfire. This story of two nations at war, two cultures that long her heads, and one family torn apart is tenderly observed and desertatingly true. Uh, so Moroccan independence is definitely something that I am interested in, post-colonial fiction, that kind of thing. Um, and I know that Leila Slimani is a Moroccan writer. I think her previous novels were more literary thrillers. Um, so I don't, that doesn't sound particularly like there's going to be a thriller aspect to it. So I'm excited to read it. Also out on the 5th of August, big publishing day, is Give My Love to the Savages by Chris Stuck. A black man's life told in the scenes through every time he's been called the N-word. A black son who visits his estranged white father in Los Angeles just as the 92 riots begin. A black Republican coping with a skin disease that has turned him white is forced to reconsider his life. A young black man fetishised by an older white woman he's just met is offered a strange and tempting proposal. The nine tales in Give My Love to the Savages illuminate the multifaceted black experience, exploring the thorny intersections of race, identity and black life through an extraordinary cast of characters. So a collection of short stories that are told from different historical perspectives um, and are all interlinked because they're about one man and every time he's been called the n-word. Um, so I uh, think this is going to be a really interesting play with form um, and it has been really highly praised um, and also I like the cover so I'm excited for that. Also out on the 5th of August is Rose Nicholson by Andrew Grieg. This one is set in winter of 1574. Queen Mary has fled Scotland to raise an army from the French. Her son and heir James Amy is held under the protection in Stirling Castle. John Knox is dead. The people are unmoored and lurching under the uncertain governance of this riven land. It's a deadly time for young student Will Fowler, short of stature, low of birth, but mightily ambitious to make his name. Fowler has found himself where the scorch marks of the martyrs burned at the stake can be seen on every street, where differences in doctrine can prove fatal, where feuds of great families pull innocence into their bloody realm. There he befends the austere stick wielding philosopher Tom Nicholson, son of a fishing family, whose sister Rose, untutored, brilliant and exceedingly beautiful, exhibits a free-thinking mind that can only bring danger to her and her admirers admirers. Not least Walter Scott, brave and ruthless heir to Braxholm and Buccleuch, who is set on exploiting the civil wars to further the, his political and dynastic ambitions. His friends and friendship and patronage will lead Will to the very centre of the conspiracy that will determine who will take Scotland's crown. I read The Game of Kings, which was also set around this time, which I really enjoyed, and again this sort of clash of religion and culture and um, civil war are things that I enjoy in historical fiction. News of the Dead by James Robertson is out on the 5th of August as well and this one has been praised by Ali Smith and I have enjoyed the one Ali Smith novel that I have read, How to Be Both. Hidden on the breathtaking mountains of wild Scotland, Glen Connock is the home of secrets and stories of fables and folklore. 
over hundreds of years, three lives are woven together. In ancient Britain, the hermit, the hermit St. Connock performs impossible miracles, which survives legends in the book of Glen Connock. Generations later, in the 19th century, the book is rediscovered by charlatan Charles Gibb, who hustles his way into the big house at the heart of the village. In the present day, young Lockie whispers to, to Maya of ghosts he has seen in, her, in the Glen. Reflecting back from the lo her, on her long life, Maya believes him as she has some ghosts of her own. So ghosts and folklore are things that I am interested in, remote, rural, isolated communities, all those sorts of things. I think this one sounds like it could be kind of creepy, kind of slow moving and has like interconnected parts of history. So hopefully it will be what for me the Bass Rock was not. All of You, Every Single One by Beatrice Hitchman is also coming out on the 5th of August. When Julia flees her unhappy marriage for the handsome tailor Yves Perret, she expects her life from now on to be, will be a challenge, not least because the year is 1911. They leave everything behind to settle in Vienna, but the happiness is increasingly diminished by Julia's longing for a child. Ada Bauer's wealthy and industrious family have sent her to Dr. Freud in the hope that he can fix her mutism and do so without scandal. But help will soon come for Ada from an unexpected quarter and change many lives irrevocably. So another book of queer history and also a book about women's mental health and the treatment of women, um, which are the things that have drawn me to this book. Out on the 17th of August is Silent Winds, Dry Seeds by Vinod Bushjit. And this one has reams and reams of praise, um, so I think it's going to be a fairly hyped book. In the 1950s, Vishnu Bhushan is a young boy yet to learn the truth beyond the rumours of his family's fractured histories. An alliance, as his mother says, of two bankrupt families. In evocative chapters, the first two decades of Vishnu's life in Mauritius unfold with a heart-wrenching closeness as he battles to experience the world beyond and the cultural, political and familial turmoil that hold on to him. Mauritian history is something I know absolutely nothing about, so using this small family story to talk about um, Mauritian history is what has drawn me to this, because as I said, I like to explore things in history I don't know through fiction first as a step in, as a gateway. Next is The Woman of Troy by Pat Barker, which is released on the 26th of August. I have not read the first Pat Barker book of Greek mythology retelling, The Silence of the Girls, but I feel like, one, I have a classic story, so I should know the story well enough to be able to read it, and two, they kind of sound like they would stand alone. But The Regeneration Trilogy by Pat Barker is one of my favourite trilogies. I really, really love that those books. Um, so I'm hoping that Pat Barker's writing will work for me, but I've only heard bad things about Silence of the Girls, which is why I've never read it. Troy has fallen and the victorious Greeks are eager to return home with the spoils of an endless war, including the women of Troy themselves. They await a fair wind for the Aegean. It has not come because the gods are offended. The body of King Priam lies unburied and desecrated, and so the victors remain in suspension, camped in the shadows of the city they destroyed as the coalition that held them together begins to unravel. Old feuds resurface and new suspicions and rivalries begin to fester. Largely unnoticed by her captors, the one-time Tro Trojan queen Briseis, formerly Achilles' slave, and now belonging to his companion Alcimus, quietly takes the in these developments. She forges alliances where she can, with Priam's aged wife, the defiant Hecuba, and with the disgraced soothsayer Calchas, all the while shrewdly seeking her path to revenge. Now, last year I read A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, which tells a similar part of the story for a big part of it. There is a section that is the Trojan women, and I also have enjoyed the play, The Trojan Women. So I think that I hopefully will enjoy this story because I didn't love A Thousand Ships because Natalie Haynes' writing style is not for me, and I know I do like Pat Barker's writing style, so I'm kind of hoping I will like this one better. Next, out on the 31st of August, is Moon and the Mars by Kia Cawthron. And this is another one that I really, really like the cover of. Set in the impoverished Five Points district of New York City in the years 1857 to 1863, we experience neighbourhood life through the eyes of Theo from childhood to adolescence, an orphan living between the homes of her black and Irish grandmothers. Throughout her formative years, Theo witnesses everything from the creation of tap dance to P.T. Barnum's sensationalist museums to the draft riots that tear NYC asunder, amidst the daily maelstrom of Five Points work. Meanwhile, white America's attitudes towards people of colour and slavery are shifting, painfully, transformationally, as the nation divides and marches to war. This is another one that has received a lot of praise, and I really like the very short time focus that is going to be used in this novel um, to explore such a, like, 
pivotal point in American history. Out on the 7th of September is a play for the end of the world by Jai Chakrabarti. New York City, 1972. Jarek Smith, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, and Lucy Gardner, a southerner newly arrived in the city, are in the first bloom of love when they receive word that Jarek's oldest friend has died under mysterious circumstances in the rural village in eastern India. Travelling there alone to collect his friend's ashes, Jarek soon finds himself enmeshed in the chaos of local politics and efforts to stage a play in protest against the government, the same play that he performed as a child in Warsaw as an act of resistance against the Nazis. Torn between the survivor's guilt he has carried for decades and his feelings for Lucy, Jarek must decide how to honour both the past and the present and how to accept happiness that he's not sure he deserves. So as I said earlier, I don't love World War II novels, but I think this look at the effects of World War II on survivors might be more interesting than a novel actually set during the war. Another Greek one now, and that is Greek Myths by Charlotte Higgins, which is coming out on the 9th of September and is a collection of new retellings of some Greek myths. Athena, Alkithoe, Philomela, Arachne, Androma Andromache, Helen, Circe, Penelope. Full of power, witches, unpredictable gods and sword-wielding slayers, their stories were also extreme. About families who turn murderously on one another, impossible tasks set by cruel kings, love that goes wrong, wars and journeys and terrible loss. There was magic, there was shape-shifting, there were monsters, there were descents to the land of the dead. Humans and immortals inhabited the same world, which was sometimes perilous, sometimes ex exciting. The stories were obviously fantastical. All the same, brothers really do war with each other. People tell the truth but aren't believed. Wars destroy the innocent, lovers are parted. For Greeks, the word mythos simply meant a traditional tale. In the 21st century, we have long left behind the political and religious framework in which these stories first circulated, but their power endures. They deal, in short, within the hard, basic facts of the human condition. Now, you might not know, I write poetry. My poetry Instagram is always linked in the description if you want to go and check out some of the poetry that I have written. And at the moment, I'm working on a collection of poetry that retells Greek myths from a woman, from some of these women's perspective. So I'm always interested to read works that does that do the same things and see the perspective that those are taking. Um, and I would love to read this one and see where that is going. And also, again, really, really nice cover. Next out on the 14th of September is Harlem Shuffle by Colton Whitehead. And this one, I didn't even read the synopsis before I knew I wanted to read it because I have not read any Colton Whitehead, but people praise his works so much that I know I need to. Um, so every one of his books is on my TBR, including this new one. Ray Carney was only slightly bent when it came to being crooked. To his customers and neighbours on 125th Street, Carney is an upstanding salesman of reasonably priced furniture. Few people know he descends from a line of uptown hoods and crooks and that his facade of normalcy has more than a few cracks in it. Her cash is tight, so if his cousin Freddy occasionally drops off the odd ring or necklace, Ray doesn't ask where it comes from. He knows a discreet Julia downtown who doesn't ask questions either. Then Freddy falls in with a crew who plan to rob the Hotel Teresa, the Waldorf of Harlem, and volunteers Ray's services as the fence. The heist doesn't go as planned. Now Ray has new clientele, one made up of shady cops, vicious local gangsters, two-bit pornographers, and assorted Harlem lowlifes. Thus begins the tussle between Ray the Striver and Ray the Crook. As Ray navigates this double life, he begins to see who actually pulls the strings in Harlem in the 1960s. This has been described as hilarious and a crime novel, and I really, really enjoy heists, um, heist movies at least. Um, I haven't read many heist books, so uh, this sounds like it's going to be like fun and a romp, which is something that I always love in historical fiction. And then finally, coming out on the 14th of September is M by Kim Thwe. Now, I've read Rue by Kim Thwe last year, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, Thwe is a Vietnamese Canadian writer uh, and writes sort of prose poetry vignettes um, that form together into a novel and this one has been described as being in that same style. Emma Jade and Louis are born into the havoc of the Vietnam War. Orphaned, saved and cared for by adults coping with the chaos of Saigon in freefall, they become children of the Vietnamese diaspora. A portrait of Vietnamese identity emerges that is wholly remarkable, honed in wartime violence that borders on genocide, and then by the ingenuity, sheer grit and intelligence of Vietnamese Americans, Canadians and other Vietnamese former refugees who go on to build some of the most powerful small business empires in the world. Vietnam is another place that I would like to learn more about the history and um, I have been trying to read more books from, uh, so this is definitely one that I want to read. Those are 25 historical fiction books that are coming out this summer. Please do let me know in the comments if any 
of them sound interesting to you I would love to hear your thoughts and please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and if you did like it I'll put the video of my literary fiction anticipated releases here and I will put a button for you to just subscribe over here if you're not subscribed already um, I would really appreciate it if you did thank you for watching and I will see you again very very soon bye bye